Imagine driving through this desert landscape, dusted with craggy rocks, little shrubby bushes, and marked by so many craters, hundreds, that it feels almost lunar. And in front of you is a 400,000-year-old extinct volcano that's big enough to be seen from space. It's called Rodin Crater. Yo, so I'm out here uh, traveling to the Rodin Crater right now. It was like really bumpy before, but I'm uh, There we go. A mil pies, gira a la izquierda. That's Byron Crenshaw driving westbound on Route 40 from his hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma towards Los Angeles. And he's making a detour through the painted desert of northern Arizona to check out Rodin Crater. And the music you're hearing, it's a song he wrote about the crater. Um, yeah, I have no idea what's about to happen. I'm just hoping I can at least see. Oh, shit. I think that's in the distance. It's like a very... Gira a la izquierda. I'm Salim Rushmwala. And from TED, this is Far Flung. In each episode, we visit a different place to understand ideas that flow from that location. This week, we're going on a field trip to the southwestern United States and through the Painted Desert, the ancestral homeland of several indigenous tribes who've been living off the land here for generations. And where some of these volcanoes have been for six million years. And we're here to see what happens when the sky is the main influence in designing structures and how space is constructed specifically to connect us with our primal relationship with light can shape the way we think and move through the world. And that brings us to the edge of the Painted Desert to meet Byron on his trip to visit Rodin Crater, which just so happens to be a vessel for one of the most expensive public arts projects ever. And don't worry, Rodin Crater is an extinct volcano. Oh, and shout out to Marriott Hotels, our sponsor for this episode. Uh, this, this is very fun. Uh, I have no idea if my car can make it there. Uh, this is on road right now, and I have all this shit in the back of my car, and it is like vibrating. Like a, oh. A few years ago, Byron learned about the Rodin Crater Project, described as a gateway to observe light, time, and space. He just knew he had to see it in person. So what is it? Well, Rodin Crater is now the life work of artist James Terrell. Ever since 1979, Terrell's been working with astronomers and architects to transform the crater's inside cone into a massive celestial observatory. The closest city, Flagstaff, is about 40 miles away, so there's almost no light or noise pollution. And there's no address to Rodin Crater, just coordinates within this mountain range. It's called the San Francisco Peaks Volcanic Field. So if you type Rodin Crater into Google Maps, as Byron did, it will take you off-road, onto a dirt path, and into a part of the desert that looks like it could be a living painting. Oh, yo, all this, oh, bro, is that it? I think that's it. Oh my God, the gates are open, (laughs) The thing about Rodin Crater is that you could easily drive past it without knowing really what's going on inside of it. And that's intentional because it's not finished or open to the public yet. There's no set completion date, but it's estimated to open in 2024. And its completion is highly anticipated in the art world. So much so that Kanye West donated $10 million towards it. So Rodin Crater is both secretive and very hard to get invited to. It's kind of like this mythical art world equivalent of Willy Wonka's factory. In a way, having the chance to go inside would be like winning the golden ticket. A golden ticket that our friend Byron does not have. But he's going to get as close as he can. Yep, it's right there. Rodent Crater, pretty amazing. This is pretty much as, as far as I can get without it being legally dubious. So I'm going to stay right here. And so why here? Why this spot? Because of the land, sky, and space that is so unique to this region. Most places I've lived, you can't see very far into the distance, either horizontally or vertically. You have buildings, houses, trees, streetlights, clouds. The sky is often obscured and feels very far away. But imagine a view with almost perfect visibility, a near edgeless night sky in a place with very little humidity and incredible clarity. That's the painted desert. So if you're building a structure here, you could face a window upwards in the ceiling. And through that window, you'd see a lot, a sky in constant motion. Here, the sky is its own landscape. And through careful observation, you can understand and interact with it. 
So the environment here kind of just naturally lends itself to architectural experimentation with light, as Terrell noticed. I wish I could go in, but I can't. Yeah, this is dope. And not being able to go inside Roding Crater turned our attention to the land and communities immediately outside of the crater. In this region, the history of designing structures in relation to light from the sky, the sun, and the constellations, it actually goes way back before Terrell. Years ago, tribes indigenous to the area developed a sophisticated architecture based on their knowledge of the land and sky here. The closer you look, the architecture here not only reflects the sky, but the people too. If you're listening to this inside a building, it's probably a four-walled rectilinear structure, basically a box made up of wooden two-by-fours covered in plaster sheetrock. But there are many other ways to design spaces. And if you're outside of one tiny area in Western Europe, there's a high chance that this default box structure is not the way that people built there in the past. Imagine walking to someone's home, but it's entirely empty. So the only clues you have about who lives there are based on the materials that the home is made out of and design elements you might not even consider, like the shape of the house, which directions the doorway faces, or how the light filters in. Walking into a typical Western home, you'd likely be left without many answers. But walking into a traditional home on the Navajo reservation, like the Hogan, you'd have an entire culture, worldview, and cosmology to discover by just observing the structure itself. And the Navajo Hogan is not just a place to live. Like Rodin Crater, it's also a tool to measure time through its alignment with the stars. But to understand this structure, you really have to go meet the people who construct it. And to do that, we're going on a field trip. You know, many areas in the Southwest are very culturally potent. So where the crater is, is the ancestral homelands of at least eight tribes. That's Wanda de la Costa. And that field trip I mentioned, we're lucky enough to be going on it with her class. All of the architecture of this region has an immense connection to sky science from an indigenous view. I think it was really imperative in my pursuit of this class to be able to bring to the attention of the larger population that would come to see the crater, that would come because of James Trail, that would come because of his geniusness around light and space, but that people would also understand our history of sky science goes very deep in the Southwest. Before the field trip, Wanda's class consulted with an anthropologist to research the history of indigenous communities in the region. And we found out that that area not only included the Hopi and the Navajo, who are most well known up in that quadrant there, but it was also Fort McDowell, Yavapai Apache, Pueblo of Zuni, Fort Mojave, Havasupai and Halapai all have history in that region. Wanda's a professor at the Design School and the School of Construction at Arizona State University. And we're interviewing people to rebuild this trip that she took out into the Painted Desert, a place where the earth is shockingly colorful and playful, but the land here is also full of blurry, complicated lines. You know, the reservation boundaries tell one story, but the second more important story are that what are the traditional territorial homelands of those people of that area? The only thing that's separating us is a boundary. And once you cross that boundary, then it's like, okay, you're on your own. You know, you don't have any electricity. You don't have any sort of running water. It's weird. You know, you can go from one world to the next within an hour. And that's happening within the United States. You know, it's supposed to be like the richest country in the world. But we're still battling this issue. That's Brian Skeet, one of Wanda's former students. Brian is Navajo, or as many Navajo call themselves, Diné. He's currently an industrial designer, and a lot of his work focuses on applying his design skills to systemic issues within indigenous communities. And as a former firefighter, he knows the land well. But on this field trip, he saw a lot of this region in a whole new way. <laughs> In Diné culture, you introduce yourself with your clans to let them know where you're from and who you are. Just even being able to tell you my clans, that for me is healing. 
These clans have been created over time and originate with the Diné creation stories. In English, Sereskizni initially is I'm of the Rock Gap clan or this my mother's clan. And then Kiyani Bashishchi, that's me born into the towering house people. And that's my father's clan. My maternal grandfather's clan is Zuni Edgewater. My paternal grandfather's clan is the Salt People. And this is the first class Brian has been in where he felt comfortable enough to introduce himself with his clans. Everything that I'm talking about right now is all stems back from like taking Wanda's classes. Like it gave me a sense of pride in knowing who I am. And no matter what happens, I can turn to my culture, my family for help. You know, being in my 30s, like I didn't really know my clans. And it kind of came to a realization where if I wanted to be a leader for my community, I had to let people know where I'm from. This wasn't information Brian was ever encouraged to share, but Wanda makes space for Indigenous students. Wanda's originally from Alberta, Canada, where she is a member of the Saddle Lake Cree Nation. She's actually the first First Nation woman to become registered and licensed as an architect in Canada. And she takes that background with her into her practice. Our architectures as Indigenous people were interrupted by the government and by the policies of the government to create this standardized housing. Um, but I think it did a disservice detaching people from the knowledge bases and their cultural life ways connected to the environment and the landscape and its processes. Wanda didn't grow up dreaming of becoming an architect. She backpacked around the world in her 20s and she fell in love with cities and places. And she became really intrigued with how culture can be practiced and preserved through traditional architecture. Her attention to place when it comes to design has really impacted students like Brian, who is from the Painted Desert region. I was born on Tuba City, so I was born on the Navajo Reservation. And then I spent majority of my life on the Grand Canyon National Park. To orient yourself, if you drive northeast from Phoenix, Arizona, the capital, up through the lush mountains of the Coconino National Forest, down into the Painted Desert and past Roden Crater, you'll hit Tuba City, a drive of about four and a half hours if you take the scenic route. Turn west from Tuba City and you'll hit the eastern rim of the Grand Canyon. It's one of the most popular national parks in in the world. Like literally summers are just filled with tourists, bus after bus after bus after bus. And Brian felt a lot more comfortable away from all the tourists. Both my parents worked for the Park Service and I spent a lot of my weekends with my grandparents and cousins, relatives who lived on the reservation and kind of was brought up traditionally that way. So between the Grand Canyon and the Navajo Reservation, home wasn't always one place. I think the one thing that tells me I'm home is the sky during the evening time. There's a certain color that the landscape brings. When I see that color, there's something about it that makes me feel like I'm home. And it's the way that the color of the sky looks when you have these dark blue, but pink and orange and super vibrant gold colors that are filling the sky. And when you see during the monsoon season, when you have the thunder clouds coming in and you see those colors that are painted and reflected off of those clouds, that's home for me. The Dine have been living in the Four Corners region of the American Southwest for hundreds of years. But it can be hard to tell where the current reservation boundaries begin and end. And on top of that, some reservations overlap with each other. So I took my students on a five-day journey walkabout around the traditional territories. And then we culminated the trip with visiting the Roden Crater. And the order of the places they visited on that field trip, that was very intentional. Wanda wanted her students to enter Roden Crater with thousands of years of history of the land in mind. According to the DNA creation story, their land is between four sacred mountains that represent the four directions, north, east, south, and west. These mountains are located in Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico. And the number four, it comes up a lot in Navajo beliefs, a fourfold harmony, four directions, four seasons, four times of day, four genders, four sacred colors, four precious stones. The number four symbolizes the interconnectedness of all things. But that connectedness has been disturbed by Western encroachment. You know, and today when I look at the reservation homes and it's completely disconnected. I mean, some of the homes are not even honoring the four directions. If you just drive past a reservation on the expressway, 
What you see out your car window, it can be deceiving. When you go down to some of the reservations that are blotted around the Phoenix area, like you know you're in a reservation when you start seeing res dogs and start seeing like dirt roads and trailers and abandoned buildings. And then you start going into the city and the houses are different, the, the roads are paved, the people are different. It's sad to see the infrastructure sort of crumble over time and see these border towns start to develop more, but none of that money is going towards any of those rural cities on the reservation. In Tuba City, Brian grew up in your standard Western house with your modern day conveniences like running water, plumbing, electricity, and air conditioning. But visiting his grandmother, who lived in a Hogan on a remote part of the Navajo reservation, he experienced an entirely different way of life. A great day is waking up early, going out, feeding the animals, being able to enjoy the, the sunrise for a little bit. Seeing how excited all the animals are to come and uh, greet you and know they're going to be fed. Taking walks with my grandma when she can and just having her tell stories and also have her make some of her fire bread for me. That's a good day. But for Brian, life outside the reservation boundaries was very different. You know, the Grand Canyon definitely has a history of pushing people off their land, especially Native people. When I was in school there, I still felt like I was an outcast, even on my own land. And this disconnect wasn't just about what knowledge was valued. It was also about the spaces they were being taught in. Even from the first time I remember going to school and just being in this almost like a prison. Like it just you you just know that once you go through those doors, that those doors are going to be shut right behind you. And then you're there for the rest of the day. You know, you have windows looking out, but something with not being connected to the ground and just being outside and, and smelling the air, you know, they put you in these cubes to try to keep your attention. You know, it's just kind of this spiral effect of not fitting in anywhere, and especially in a place where you'd like to call home, but you can't really call home because your culture's lost. He felt that way even when he left for college. Even coming down to Phoenix and going to school at ASU, which is all native land, I still felt like a stranger. You know, uh, it's just frustrating to still talk to people, even here in Phoenix, and still get kind of a surprise type of reaction saying, wait, there's still natives here? Like, I thought you guys were all gone. Just hearing that, it's like, are you kidding me? And that erasure is one of the things that Wanda seeks to address in her class. Part of this work in indigenous architecture and what we're aiming to do is to really understand through the narrative of the people of that place, what is important for them to preserve. But since so much of this knowledge is place and people based, even if you're physically there and grow up there, to learn it, you need access to elders. And given the political and economic realities, that can be difficult as younger generations move off the land. My grandmother was born in 1905. She didn't grow up into a house. She grew up living on the land. So the government was trying to corral uh, the Indigenous people onto reserves. But my grandmother and my grandfather's generation lived on the land. And as a result, you become more aware of what's happening with the land. And so you get used to the the day and night cycles of the universe, when the sun rises, when it goes down, what the temperatures, when the seasons change, because so many of the things that you do have to be done outside. And I think with our beautifully protective, insulated, air-conditioned homes, we lose that affinity with our outside world. And all that really stood out to Wanda on that backpacking trip she took around the world. I traveled in many different climatic zones, and I think that was perhaps one of the biggest impacts that came to me. You know, I I remember in Thailand, the thatch roofs over the day beds where you could have a nap, you know, in structures that were so conducive to getting airflow, blocking the sun, being made of natural materials, going back into the earth. It's very sustainable. And so when we come back to North America and I see this diverse climatic zones, I wonder why we're all building with wood frame construction with almost the same wall assemblies from north to south. And this question really disturbed Wanda when she returned home from her travels. Seeing these boxy reservation houses seemingly randomly across the landscape, it just didn't seem right. 
for me, there was a large disconnect. And when I see people living in their original environments and then to expect people to flourish in built environments that have no connection to who they are as people and their belief systems was really hard for me. And that's when I became interested in architecture. It's interesting. I think a lot about defaults when I'm in office spaces, especially spots where I lived in southern Japan and Mumbai, India, both places where it's very hot. And the default office clothing that people would wear, a lot of times it was neckties. And instinctually, it just felt like that default was wrong even though it was normalized. And just like clothes, it feels like buildings should match our environment too. Over the last 100 years, there's been a number of movements in architecture, but I think one of the most impactful and unfortunately detrimental to many cultures' original architecture was the modernism movement. So through that movement, it came out that certain trends in architecture, which many of them originated in Europe, became universal. So this homogenous landscape of architecture was spreading globally. And as Wanda said, modernism produced a very narrow vision of the future. If we create these simple houses that function well enough and are efficient, we'll satisfy the basic human needs. But with this approach, there was something missing. What they forgot was the spirit of place and all of the histories that exist in each of these locations in the world cannot be homogenized into a a neat and compact package that can be sold universally. I think now architecture is in the reverse and starting to reconsider that movement that essentially was detrimental to many, many cultures, original architectures. And Wanda said when she's teaching, she doesn't try to force lessons into some neat, compact package, like a book or a classroom. You know, there's a certain humility that goes along with this work. As an architect, you are brought up to believe you have all the answers, that you come with answers, that your four years of training somehow gives you this leg up to be able to propose these amazing ideas to a host of different cultures and communities. That is not the case. I I don't believe right now that we are able to honor the diversity in our world with the current curriculum that is offered in architecture school. So Wanda stresses to her students how essential it is to ask their clients, What do they want to uplift? What are they aspiring to? What are their concerns? What are their challenges? And so when it comes to design for Wanda, it doesn't start at a drafting table. It starts with observing the site at hand and listening to the stories of the people from that place. And so let's go do that and get on that bus. Now, here's an ad I've had a hand in creating, working with our sponsor, Marriott Hotels, to tell stories that expand horizons and open minds to new perspectives. Since the pandemic started, I've been going on long walks, sometimes up to two hours. It helps me clear my head. And honestly, walking is when I feel the most inspired and creative. I get away from any screens. My senses feel alert. If I walk long enough, I start to reset and take in the sights that I normally just pass by. On the last one, I met a friendly man who had covered his bright car in gigantic Hello Kitty decals, photographed a Sikh temple that I'd somehow never noticed before, and saw a combination car wash, tattoo parlor, piercing, auto, tire store for the first time. And this was all within a three-mile radius of my house, all places I've driven by hundreds of times. When you're driving, you can't really talk to people out your car window and things can blur by, but... I've got no sense of rushing on those walks. Even if I'm using the time to, you know, think or do some writing in my head, interruptions tend to be interesting. It can feel like a slow little adventure. It always fascinates me how a slight change in context can turn anything into travel. In these unprecedented times, the way we experience the world around us has changed, but Marriott Hotel's love of travel and commitment to their guests will always remain constant. As part of the Marriott Bonvoy family, Marriott Hotels is committed to providing a safe environment that aligns with expert protocols. Check them out at MarriottHotels.com. That's M-A-R-R-I-O-T-T Hotels.com. And let your mind travel.
First stop, cross the border into New Mexico. From Phoenix, head northeast for about 300 miles, up through the Tonto National Forest, cross the Salt River, and drive through the open skies of this very small town called Crown Point, New Mexico. Turn off at Navajo Technical University and go meet Dr. Fowler, a mathematician and the Dean of DNA Studies. My name is Henry Fowler. My plans are 48 inch. So I say a couple of so to translate, Dr. Fowler's traditional clans are Bitter Water and Zuni Edgewater, and his maternal grandparents are Many Goats, and his paternal grandparents are Red Running Into the Water. Dr. Fowler is from a small town on the Navajo Reservation just off of U.S. Route 160. It's north of Tuba City, closer to the Utah border, and only has a population of a few hundred people. So not a lot of light pollution. On warm summer nights, he slept outside, quite literally under the stars. When you see the stars, it's our guidance for Navajo. It tells us our direction, which way is east, and it provides a compass for Navajo people, is how the stars are moving at night. So that is in relationship to time. He carried himself like a leader. And when he talked, everyone listened. And the place where they were listening was not a typical classroom. The room was circular in the style of a hogan. But this was a supersized hogan, built to fit about 100 people inside. So picture kind of like an igloo in that it has a domed ceiling, but its base is an octagon. It's sustainably constructed with local unprocessed materials like logs of pinion or juniper wood or ponderosa pine. It has an earthen floor and a fire hearth in the center. And so the moment Brian walked in, he immediately noticed something kind of funny happening. The students that were not Native, they sat down, just like in any room, while all the Native students came in and walked in a clockwise circle around the Hogan before sitting down. We just automatically knew that we just needed to walk in that certain direction. I thought that was really cool. The few students who were Navajo did what they always do in their own homes. But in the middle of this Hogan, where the fire pit would usually be, there was a whiteboard and seats that were in a circle around it. I wish more classrooms on the reservation were more like that because I feel like having those rows and having the board right up in the front is very institutionalized. And the Navajo tradition of entering a hogan on the east side and walking in a clockwise direction, or sunwise, once inside, is similar to the apparent movement of the sun. So even when you're inside, you're still connected to the cosmos. And that's important because the stars contain knowledge that guide the DNA to understand the order of the universe. Today, this knowledge is mostly passed down by medicine men and elders, but tradition teaches that the holy people, or deities, handed down this knowledge, which is referred to as the fundamental law, to teach the DNA how to live in harmony with one another and the earth. And that law is nature. And we listen to nature. We observe nature. And we use that teaching to build our character, to build our social structure, and to respect nature. And in 2020, when it comes to thinking of nature and how we orient ourselves, the default for a lot of people is often looking down at their phones, at a map of the land surrounding them. But traditionally, for many Navajo, living in this place where you can almost always see the night sky clearly, nature starts with that sky. In Navajo mythology, the main constellations not only provide light in the absence of the moon, they also function to reinforce social laws. Like how the Big Dipper, or First Man, and Cassiopeia, First Woman, are continuously rotating around the North Star, the Fire Star. They symbolize a couple in a hogan, cooking over a fire. The stars also function as calendars and clocks. They indicate direction, time, the seasons, when to plant harvest, basically every part of your life. You'll hear crickets, you'll hear the breeze, you'll feel like you're so close to the constellations. It's like that you're able to just touch it. So when I go to different places that it's raining or you can't see the stars, I'm lost in my orientation. But for Navajo, it's that serenity is watching and observing the constellations. 
Growing up on the land, Dr. Fowler was practicing math in his everyday life, doing things like building a hogan, but many of his students did not have that experience. So he converted the hogan into a teaching tool to carry on cultural values and skills that he felt were being lost. In its own way, the hogan is a model of the cosmos. We're a kinesthetic people. We have to touch things, to move with things, to develop our sense and to learn and to understand and to synthesize and to help us think abstractly. So when I talk about the stars in relationship to Hogan is how our ancestors would build a Hogan. And the method of building a Hogan is very specific. It's believed to have been decreed by the gods to first man and first woman who built the first Hogan based on how all Hogan should later be constructed. According to tradition, the Hogan must be built in a single day, have two openings, and be in alignment with the four directions. And it's all done by um, using a rope. For back then was a yucca rope. And they would use the yucca rope to draw the circle out on the ground. And so it takes like two people. One would hold the yucca rope and then one would be so the one that walks all the way around to make the circle. Basically making a human-sized drawing compass. So then they start making different marks within the circle to develop different geometric polygons. So they place them on the circle so that they put the main poles of the Hogan there. So when the Hogan is built, the four main poles are aligned to point directly at four specific directions, marked by four stars in the sky. Once the walls are up, you build a roof, which has an opening or smoke hole. And that dome at the top is oriented to the sky. And when you're in the Hogan at night, you can see how the stars are moving. And then there's the other opening at the Hogan entrance, which always faces east. We capture the sunlight that comes into the Hogan. When we open our door, we orient our house to the east towards where the sun is coming out from in the morning. So when we open that door of our Hogan, we bring in the light and that light captures the back wall of our Hogan, so which would be the west side. And Dr. Fowler watched his elders mark where the light was hitting the back wall of the Hogan with a piece of charcoal. And those charcoal lines on the wall mark how the sunlight is moving throughout the whole year. So the walls basically chart the movement of the sun and the cosmos. By marking where the light falls on the walls of the Hogan, you can figure out the solstices and equinoxes, which signal the changing of the seasons. The two solstices happen on days when the sun's path in the sky is the farthest north or south from the equator. Knowing all that tells you when to plant. And the equinoxes, which happen in March and September, are the days when the sun is exactly above the equator, which means the day and night are of equal length. When they open the Hogan, they know the solstice. So when that June sunlight comes in, it will hit on the the northwest side of the Hogan. And the winter solstice in December will hit on the southwest side of the Hogan wall. And when the Hogan door is open, it'll bring in that light to capture the equinox. And on those days, the light splits the Hogan exactly in half. And that duality, that symmetrical divide, is symbolic. So to Navajo, that is a very powerful source of energy that awakens and enlightens the space, the consciousness. Once I learned that, like it just opened up like a whole world of possibilities for me. So the Hogan, which to Brian had seemed like this basic everyday structure, was actually this incredibly sophisticated tool that he had seen his whole life but didn't know how to use. And you know how Brian had mentioned the Navajo students all walking clockwise around the Hogan? Dr. Fowler explained that moving clockwise through the Hogan also guides thinking, planning, action, and reflection. So each quadrant of the Hogan is oriented towards a direction which has its own energy, season, significance, and color. So, for example, the east is associated with thought, the rising sun, spring, and the color white. The south is associated with planning, the midday sun, summer, and the color blue. The west is associated with action, the setting sun, fall, the color yellow, 
And then the north is associated with reflection, the night sky, winter, the color black. So you reflect back on your thinking, your planning, your action. Then you massage it. You make changes. And this is a cycle process every day that we go through. We have to have a purpose in life. And that purpose in life is interconnection with the constellations, with the air, with the water. So we are one with everything. So the Hogan is kind of like a life compass, providing both practical and spiritual direction. Today, some Navajo families who live in Western homes keep a Hogan structure on their property for ceremonies. But like Brian said, if you don't know how to use the Hogan or how it's constructed, the consciousness and knowledge that it's built to nurture can also be lost. After leaving that session, I felt empowered to just be a Navajo and understanding like that this structure meant so much more than just a structure that housed my grandparents. I knew that when you get up, you always greet the sun, you, you say a prayer, and you always greet it to the east. But I never knew why the Hogan faced the east. You know, our ancestors weren't just wandering around aimlessly, but they were actually observing and understanding the constellations. They were taking the time to document all this and in, embed it within the structures. There's all these spots around the world that are considered huge historical mysteries. Stonehenge, the pyramids, the Nazca Lines, where we can make intelligent guesses as to why they're there, how they relate to the sky, but we can't just ask anyone about them. To state the obvious, this is very clearly not one of those cases. The people with the knowledge of how this architecture works, they're all still with us. And that knowledge stays alive with practice. But Brian told us it's hard to practice it because... I feel like being an indigenous person, you're always being dismissed. You know, with our culture, it's, it's, we're, not, we're taught not to, to argue. We're taught not to think negative thoughts. And I think that makes it easier for people to dismiss us sometimes. But at the same time, I think it shows a certain amount of respect you have for a human being. And I think people are starting to figure out, it's like, we should have listened. I think when you start bringing in materials that are not from that area, then there's a disconnection between the land you're living on and what you're building. Because you look at the Hogan, the materials that it's made out of, how it's structured. It is structured in a way where it keeps you cool, especially during the summertime. These are things that, that aren't just learned because that's the only materials that they had to use, but it's learned over time of like what works best in that area. When you come down here to Phoenix, Everything is built out of concrete. It stays hot throughout the night. But sustainable structures were being built near Roden Crater as early as 700 AD. Before Terrell, Roden Crater was not well known. But another crater nearby, called Sunset Crater, was actually already famous. Sunset Crater is symbolically significant because of how it shaped the region. Around 1100 AD, Sunset Crater erupted and blanketed the area in ash, forcing the indigenous people nearby to abandon their homes. But all the cinder and ash from the eruption actually created this very fertile soil in what was a very arid environment. And so the soil attracted several tribes to come farm, build, and trade, creating this cultural melting pot and community about 12 miles north of Sunset Crater. Today, it's an archaeological site called Wapatki National Monument. Wapatki is this ancient symbol of how people from various nations can come together and create a peaceful society. And all that is thanks to the eruption of Sunset Crater. It was pretty cool because like, it was this natural kind of blowhole that would blow like cool air out. So it was almost like the mountains are breathing. It kind of serves as a reminder of why the volcano erupted in the first place. And there's stories being told about that, that people were living out of balance, like people were not good to each other and people were betting, gambling, doing all these sorts of bad things. So the cinder cones are kind of like this reminder of them. It's like, this is why we need to live peacefully. This is why we need to live in good intention and keep a well-balanced life or else the peaks will erupt again. And the story of Sunset Crater brings our field trip back full circle, nearby to where we first met Byron, at Roden Crater, about 20 miles southeast of Wapaki. There he is! 
yeah. Technically, we first saw Byron while Googling Rodin Crater. Hello. My name is Byron. <laughs> Everything about Byron kind of makes you want to smile. Experimental musician, Frida Kahlo sweatshirt, runs barefoot, you know, free spirit. And his written review of the exterior of one of the most expensive public arts projects in history. Oh, <laughs> I have your review right here. It's a one word review. You just wrote nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was. <laughs> yeah. The opening to this nice crater is two miles wide and the edges are leveled in this really cool way. It's called celestial vaulting, basically an effect that makes the sky feel very close and incredibly vibrant. Of course, this also means there is no protection from above. When you're inside, you're totally exposed to the elements. And sometimes the weather is so erratic that you might experience all the seasons in one hour there. Sunshine, rain, hail, snow. So you're in this structure designed to connect us with the elements instead of shield us from them. Some people come to art and look at it. This is one of the problems with contemporary art. And so they don't actually enter the realm of the artist's involvement. We have a little more of a distance there. And the situation of the journey to the place, the Golden Crater, the fact that you actually have to do something or some involvement to have this come over you, you have to quiet and it actually makes this experience that whole experience that day like it was really radically eye-opening i think that it's really important that we learn how we make spaces informs us and informs our whole perspective because it's like when i go into places and there's no windows it's hard not to feel disconnected it's easy to turn my brain off get into the thought loop of like i'm gonna grind i'm gonna like make money check emails and that default of you know just tuning out the world to get through the daily grind also happens unintentionally in a lot of ways like not being aware of the history of the land we're on i didn't even know the full extent of the suffering of native american people as someone who did live on historic native american land that's why I hope that when the crater does open, they'll do a lot to really acknowledge not only the immediate heritage of the land and of the actual artistic style, but acknowledge the actual like culture itself that came from, you know? And so, Byron, we hope you're still with us on this trip because we are finally about to go inside of Rodin Crater. It's just about 20 miles south from Upatki, and this is our last stop. Then we ended up going to Rodin Crater. No idea where we're going. You know, we're passing cinder cone by, you know, cinder cone. And all of a sudden we kind of see like this crater out in the, in the distance. Like, okay, that's probably the one. We drive up to it and there's this building that's half built into the side of the crater. But arriving at the crater was bittersweet for Brian. He told us the intentions behind it seemed murky. So what's the backstory? Well, back in 1974... Terrell spent seven months flying over the western states, searching for the perfect spot to create this earthwork piece that he'd been dreaming of. When he saw the sun setting on the crater from above, he landed nearby, walked up to it, and slept inside the crater. Watching the sky from inside, he imagined the possibility of transforming the volcano's cone into an elaborate network of tunnels and passageways, and having them all align with solar and celestial phenomena of that region making it the perfect spot for this art project that he'd been dreaming up. And when he found out it was on the property of a privately owned family ranch, he was able to eventually raise enough money and negotiate a deal with the family that owned it to buy it. And since then, Terrell's been fundraising to complete his project. He hopes to do that through a partnership with ASU, which is raising $200 million for it. And so as part of that partnership, some students from ASU have been able to visit it as part of their coursework. And that's how Wanda's class ended up there. But some students had mixed feelings. In a way, it kind of made me perturbed inside because it shows that any person can just take a piece of land and just make it their own. And so they first arrive there and they're shown all these papers laying out the construction plan. And the plan is to have 21 viewing spaces and six tunnels that funnel sunlight into the recesses of the crater during daylight hours 
and that offer epic views of the planets and stars at night. And then all of a sudden, James Terrell walks in. At this time, like, I'm not really happy with what he's doing. And so, given the history of the land and the present day realities on the reservation, to Brian, Rodent Crater just felt a bit out of place. What I've learned from Wapaki and Dr. Fowler, I have a lot of questions for him. Brian didn't get to ask all the questions he wanted to, partially because James Terrell had a cold. Brian verifies that he wasn't faking. He seemed to really have a bad cold, which really struck me. It's kind of like Dorothy makes it all the way down the yellow brick road and gets to Oz, but the wizard has a cold. So with all these lingering questions on his mind, Brian goes to check it out. We go to the top of the crater and there's this opening. And when we go into the opening, they close the door behind us and there's this circle on this wall. And that circle, it's a ray of light that changes form based on the time of day or night that the light is shining through. You can't help but look. It's low-key sensory deprivation everywhere but where the light is shining. Just opposite of the circle is this long tunnel. It looks like it's going all the way up to the top of the crater. And like, oh, that's that's amazing. And it's just like this perfectly well-lit circle. I was like, how is that possible? It's possible through a lot of complicated calculations involving the projected path of the sun and the moon and the sky. In simplest terms, it's possible because the tunnel is like this monumental pinhole camera. It transmits light from a portal in the east onto the stone wall of the chamber. So we end up going up through the tunnel. The tunnel is maybe like a quarter of a mile. And it's just kind of like this slight incline. So by the time you get up to the top, it's like this, you know, your, your gam gams are pretty sore and, you know, your, your butt's kind of burning a little bit. In case you're wondering, gam gams are calves, by the way. When you get to the top, there's this staircase. It's looking up towards the sky. And you just see this opening. And depending on where you're standing, it kind of looks like this giant circular skylight. But there's no glass covering it, of course. The light is actually shining perfectly down into the tunnel, all the way down to the wall at the very bottom and making this perfect circle. And you start looking for flaws in how the thing is structured. And it's like, you can't find any. This thing is built really well. And a lot of the architect students are just blown away by it. And I'm blown away by it too. And and the next area, we, we kind of walk down this like dark hallway, kind of lit up by these little LEDs in the, on the floor. And there's a circle in the roof, maybe about 40 feet up and there's benches all the way around in a circle and in that room they're told to sing and their voices are naturally amplified in a very unusual way and it sounds so magical that it really caught brian off guard as i'm going through all these different rooms that bitterness and that why why would he do this you know that all kind of started to like be silenced a little bit but not in a bad way like it was like as being mesmerized It's like, ah, this is cool. When I look back on it, even to this day, like I'm still conflicted on whether I should be still be kind of like perturbed about it or if I should be celebrating it. So on the one hand, Brian is fascinated by what Terrell is doing. And I think the way that he introduces light in his pieces, especially Ruben Crater, it really allows you to focus on just the the bare minimum, the most simplistic part of flight, and how much beauty that can create. In his piece, he's, he's bringing that connection between the sky and the earth. And I, th- I think that's why I can relate with it so much is because in our stories, our Navajo stories, there's a connection between the two. There will always be a connection between the sky and the land. There can't be one without the other. But on the other hand, it's still so complicated. Wherever we build, whether it's on private or public land, there's this default assumption in the United States that with the right paperwork, you can own it. But as far as our culture goes, Diné culture is that you don't own land. We're all here to use the land and to use it in a way where we respect it. We grow from it and we give back to it. That's kind of something you cannot really explain to this culture and society is that there is a sense of ownership. Like, I am this person, I have this much money, I own this land, I can do whatever I want with it. 
And that's just entirely the opposite of what my community wants to do with the land. This feels like a good place to mention that we tried to reach Terrell for comment, but we were told Terrell didn't want to talk about the piece until it was complete, which is a long time from now. Setting the land itself aside for a moment, for most of us, one place you can't own is the sky. We all look to the sky for answers. I felt that connection between myself and and James Terrell, that we can all connect by a human standard. We're always looking up. That kind of made me feel better about the way I felt when I was within Road Crater, because regardless of our skin color, regardless of where we came from, we found this commonality. That was the sky. For a long time, I was very conflicted. Like I was like, I should be pissed off at this guy. Why a white man would come out here and build something and just take something and think that everyone's gonna, you know, love this. And my design side was like, this is really amazing. It's an engineering marvel. It's beautiful. And those sides were just clashing with each other. And who thought that a class like this would bring some sort of soul-searching aspect to it? But that's why I remember this class. Architectural discussions aside, there's a lot there. Tons of questions about who gets to do what with what land and how far we can go to challenge the default architectural structures and power structures. But the bigger things that Brian and Wanda kept coming back to is the idea that there's a lack of interconnectivity in modern life and just how much this mindset of disconnect is normalized. So if you really want to reshape the idea of default, start looking at the indigenous communities and seeing what they're doing. Because right now you're really just trying to reinvent the wheel. Is it really necessary to build a huge community in the middle of a, of a desert? Is it really necessary to build that community in the first place? I think that's where we kind of have to reshape our thinking as architects and as designers, is that, is it necessary to build this? What are we trying to achieve? And so Wanda suggests that the best way to learn how to think as an architect is to actually go out and build with what she calls the cultural brokers, the master builders. When we started working with the tribe, we ended up building a couple of their vernacular structures to be able to understand the meaning all the way to the material. And when you're on site building with them, they will share all of those lessons with you. And that is the most wonderful way to be able to connect to the meanings associated with the built environment here. And that's so interesting to me. I mean, during these conversations, I kept thinking about visiting or staying in one of these structures But the idea of participating somehow in building one, that thought never even came to me. It's like the difference between listening to music and making music. It seems like, yeah, of course the making would force a deeper engagement. So for me, that was one big takeaway. This idea of searching for ways of learning that involve very deep dives into work with our surrounding community. Hard to imagine in COVID times, but I also think we have to keep reminding ourselves about the importance of being physically engaged with our communities. I really don't want us to get stuck in the even more restricted defaults of internet Zoom world. You know, many of us living in air conditioned buildings and talking on our cell phones and, you know, not looking up, we get disconnected. It's just a natural part of living in a city. I think Indigenous people offer a really beautiful lens, particularly in the time that we are in now. We can't travel, we feel quite isolated. This interconnectedness offers a value-based strategy for the future that is about connecting not only the cosmos, but our lived spaces, uh, the people that inhabit those and that carry that deep knowledge of our natural universe. This is what is missing in our contemporary world. We do things in silos. We all operate individualistically. And I think this concept of interconnectedness allows us all to come together and think collectively as a human species that is connecting with our natural environment and that is connecting with our built environment. And I think an Indigenous lens is what will bring us there. Far Flung with Salim Rushamwala is produced by Jesse Baker and Eric Newsom of Magnificent Noise for TED. Our production staff includes Elise Blenner-Hassan, Huete Gitana, Kim Naderfane-Peterson, Sabrina Farhi, Angela Chang, and Michelle Quint. 
with the guidance of Roxanne Highlash and Colin Helms. Our fact checkers are Paul Durbin and Nicole Bodie. Ad stories are produced by Transmitter Media. This episode was mixed and sound designed by Kristen Muller. Additional music and sound design by Chris Zabriski and Elise Blenner Hassett. Special thanks to Lemon Gua for your ethereal music and to Byron Crenshaw of The Growth Eternal for sharing your music and video footage with us. And by the way, Byron's album, Bass Tone Paintings, just came out and it's amazing. Abundant gratitude to Wanda De La Costa, Brian Skeet, Dr. Fowler, Richard Begay, Joseph Kunkel, Selena Martinez, Shanice Bryant, Ned the Mojaved, Jessica Yu, Patrick Young, and Edward Krupp for your time, guidance, and expertise. Our executive producer is Eric Newsom. I'm Salim Rushamwala. Special thanks to our sponsors, Marriott Hotels and Women Will, a Grow with Google program.